Hi everyone, my name is Henry, I'm one of the final years, and today I'm going to talk about healthcare of the elderly. So healthcare of the elderly is a small part of the fourth year curriculum, but it is very relevant to F1 and all of clinical practice. A lot of the topics are quite fluffy, so I'm hoping to be able to extract what's useful for you. Um, and I've used uh, the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine and Clinical Specialties, as well as some of the lectures and from what I remember from my past papers. So the main topics I'm going to cover are delirium, dementia, incontinence and pharmacology with a little bit about falls, palliative care, comprehensive geriatric assessments and elder abuse. We'll start off with delirium, which is otherwise known as the acute confusional state. The definition of this is a disturbed consciousness or cognitive functional perception with an acute onset and fluctuating course. So these patients generally uh, either have a decreased level of consciousness uh, something about their cognitive function is deranged, whether that be their attention uh, or their problem-solving ability or something like that. And they may also have uh, problems with their perception, maybe auditory or visual hallucinations. The most important things are that this is acute, it's not a chronic process like dementia, and it fluctuates hour to hour and day to day. Patients often exhibit something called sunsetting, where delirious patients get a lot worse and more hyperactive during the evening, so that's when you tend to get bleep to them. I'll talk about hypo and hyperactive delirium in a minute. So there's lots of different causes, and there is a mnemonic. I don't know particularly how helpful it is, but I've highlighted the most important causes that tend to come up in exams. I'll go through drugs a bit more in the next slide, but any kind of electrolyte change uh, can cause it. Uh, if someone's in pain, that's, uh, they're more likely to uh, be delirious. Infection is one of the biggest causes, and this tends to be UTIs, but also respiratory tract infections and CNS infections are important considerations to rule out when we're investigating these patients. Uh, respiratory failure, I don't think that's particularly important. Um, constipation and urinary retention, I think these really come under pain. Uh, anything that causes discomfort uh, is a, is a uh, predictor of delirium. Metabolic disturbances, whether that be glucose problems or anything else, uh, can also cause it, but again, it's quite non-specific. So talking about drugs now, these are a really common cause of it, uh, and the, they tend to be the anticholinergics or any drug with an anticholinergic effect. So antidepressants, SSRIs, TCAs, any antipsychotics, antihistamines, drugs for incontinence, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, opiates, uh, generally just because they decrease consciousness levels, um, and they can cause other things such as constipation as well. Um, toxicity of drugs, so whether that be alcohol or indeed prescription drugs such as digoxin, uh, lithium, anything like that, and then withdrawal from drugs as well. So these patients present in one of two ways generally. They either are hypoactive, so they're your patients on the Jerry's ward that are asleep in the middle of the day, they're quiet, they don't respond during rounds, uh, they're very withdrawn. On the other side of the spectrum is hyperactive delirium. These patients are agitated, they're noisy, uh, they can be quite aggressive. And these are generally the patients that you get bleeped to uh, because they're causing problems on the ward and the nurses may want you to come and uh, see them, maybe even sedate them, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, and whether that's the right course of action. It's worth being aware that sometimes delirious patients can show signs of mild psychosis, whether this be delusions or hallucinations. The hallucinations are usually um, visual, whereas in psychosis they tend to be uh, auditory. So to investigate delirious patients, we need to first of all establish their baseline level of cognition. You know, if these patients have been uh, in this state for many months, it might point to a different cause, such as dementia. Uh, there is a quick way we can screen, and this did come up in a past question, uh, I think in my ICA. So we can screen with the confusion assessment method, which requires two things, that the presentation has an acute and fluctuating course, and they have some kind of inattention. And a crude way to test this is whether they can count from 20 backwards to 1. And then they need to have either disorganised speech or altered consciousness, and that really reflects their uh, cognitive defect. In terms of investigating these patients, you need to see why they're in hospital, what brought them in, what signs do they have. But if you're unsure, 
generally a full set of blood, so FBC to look for any signs of infection or anemia, UNEs and a bone profile to look for electrolyte disturbance, look for UTIs, look for respiratory tract infections, and if they are on any drugs that require drug level monitoring, you can, you can check that as well. ECGs and ABGs as well, if you're really unsure. You might want to consider a CT head, as behavioural change can be a sign of uh, intracranial pathology, and maybe even an LP for uh, either meningitis or encephalitis, and an EEG as well to check their brain function. I think management here is really where the questions will focus, and the most important thing is to treat the cause of the delirium. But equally, if you're called to an acutely delirious patient, whether that be hypo or hyperactive patients, it's really important to reorientate them. And this is obviously quite a difficult thing to define, but it, it's things like just telling them where they are. It's things like putting a clock in front of them so they know what time it is, um, you know, turning the lights on when it's day and turning them off when it's nighttime, things like that. You need to assess their hydration and nutrition because both of these things can contribute to delirium. A sedation is difficult, but it's generally best not to sedate them. Certainly in a question you know, that says this patient is aggressive, what are you going to do? It's rare that the first line is sedation, unless they are a danger to themselves or others, or you've tried other de-escalation techniques such as reorientation. And generally this is done with IM, haloperidol, or olanzapine. Um, the reason we don't use oral meds is because uh, it's difficult to get them to take tablets. So really, I think the take-home messages for this is that delirium is acute and fluctuating. Some people call it brain failure, acute brain failure. In the same way that someone can get an acute kidney injury, delirium isn't really a, a diagnosis in itself, but it's just how, how a patient presents when their brain is failing for whatever reason. It usually affects older people, and it's important to consider the cause and then treat it. In a question, if reorientate the patient is an option, it's probably the right answer. Okay, let's talk about dementia now. So there's four types of dementia we need to consider, and by far the most common is Alzheimer's disease, with 60% of dementia cases uh, being this type. This is generally characterised by amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, but I'm not going to focus too much on the pathology. You can go back to the second year lectures if you care about that. Vascular dementia is lots of small infarcts or small strokes going on. Um, and then you've got Lewy body dementia, which is a Parkinson's plus disease. And it's characterized by alpha-synuclein deposits. And then you've got frontotemporal or PIX dementia, which is rare, but generally um, this means that they have a focal atrophy in the frontal and temporal regions. I'll talk a bit more about each disease and how they present now. So Alzheimer's disease is generally uh, their, their memory and cognitive function shows a steady decline and they have selective neuronal loss in the hippocampus, the amygdala and the temporal lobes. Risk factors for it, um, family history of, of Alzheimer's disease. Down syndrome is an important one and they like that in exams. It's because the ApoE4 um, gene is on chromosome 21, so obviously people with trisomy 21 have more of this gene and are more likely to develop early onset Alzheimer's. Also uh, things like depression and loneliness can contribute to Alzheimer's risk. Lewy body dementia, uh, generally the question will show someone with uh, memory loss as well as hallucinations, these will probably be visual, and movement disorder. Um, this has a very variable progression uh, but the important things to remember are hallucinations and, and movement problems. Vascular dementia, in the question, they'll have vascular risk factors, maybe previous strokes, hypertension, diabetes, previous MI, something like that. They might be obese. Uh, it's worth, worth considering. And this shows a stepwise progression. As they get these infarcts, they deteriorate, and then they stay stable, and they uh, deteriorate further. Frontotemporal, the main uh, presentation of this is loss of inhibitions. If you remember the frontal cortex um, is to do with sort of regulating behavior and when this is lost the patient loses their inhibitions so um, maybe patients are aggressive uh, maybe they're sexually inappropriate something like that generally points towards frontotemporal which is otherwise known as PICS dementia 
So how do we investigate? So I got this from NICE. It's probably worth reading the full guidelines. Um, but you need to take a history from the patient and a collateral from the relative. Uh, that's really important in this. Um, you need to exclude reversible causes. Uh, so you might do a set of bloods um, and examine them, uh, whatever's relevant. Next, we need to do a cognitive test. And I'll talk about this more on the next slide. Um, and then once we've excluded reversible causes and we're still suspicious of dementia, we send them off to the memory clinic. And that's generally run by neurologists or geriatricians. And they'll probably consider some kind of cross-sectional imaging to rule out other causes. Um, just to note, what you might see on, on CT or MR is, is global atrophy uh, of the brain. So you see deepening of the sulci and general loss of volume. Okay, so cognitive testing. This is a little bit strange, um, but there are lots of different ones. The MOCA, the ACE3, and the Mini Mental State Exam are the ones you've heard of probably and that you see on the wards. RUDAS is, is one they use as an example. It has no cultural bias. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about them. Maybe have a look. We had a mocker in our final year OSCE um, this year, so it's worth looking at. Um, what NICE recommend are a validated brief cognitive instrument, and they, they give a few examples called the 10CS and 6CIT. I've never heard of these. Um, I don't think they're really worth learning, but it's important to remember why we do them and when we do them as well. So managing Alzheimer's disease, we need to, as a first line, offer something called cognitive stimulation and rehabilitation. Uh, that can be initiated, I guess, in the memory clinic or, or by GPs. Um, the important thing is that none of these treatment decisions are for non-specialists, so GPs without special interest in Alzheimer's, um, and it's certainly not an F1 decision to be starting these drugs. But as soon as someone's got mild Alzheimer's, they're going to be started on an anticholinesterase inhibitor. And what that does is it blocks the enzyme that breaks down um, the acetylcholine, uh, so that improves brain function. Examples of this, the main one is donepezil and that can be given orally. It has some GI side effects, but nothing too significant. If they have poor compliance to oral meds, which is a problem, they can be given galantamine extended release, which is another uh, one of this class of drugs. Rivastigmine can be given as a transdermal patch, but I don't think you need to know too much about that. If they are resistant to these drugs, or it's a severe case, then they can be given an NMDA antagonist, such as memantine. Um, again, it, it's all specialist decisions, um, but the important thing is they will be sussed on this even when they show just mild symptoms. So treating vascular dementia, you need to modify their cardiovascular risk factors, whatever they may be, and consider antiplatelets. I couldn't find anything particularly definitive on when you start antiplatelets, um, but certainly most of these patients will have had uh, strokes or something, or TIAs in the past, so they'll be on them anyway, uh, or MIs. Lewy body dementia, uh, that's treated like Alzheimer's, so with cholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, obviously, if they are showing other signs of Parkinson's, then they need referral to a neurologist, and they may consider starting carbidopa. So, a few little things on dementia. I guess it's kind of OSCE stuff, but it's a multidisciplinary uh, team that needs to be involved. OTs, PTs, someone to look at their home. They'll need a package of care. Always exclude reversible causes. Um, there's something called pseudo-dementia, which is effectively when someone is so depressed that they exhibit dementia signs. This tends to present with a global cognitive decline, so not in one particular area of the patient's cognition. And classically, it's a patient whose partner, wife, husband, etc., has, has died. They've been very depressed, and their son or daughter has brought them in with uh, concerns over their memory. Anticholinergic drugs, like we talked about in delirium, so your antidepressants, antipsychotics, antihistamines, etc., they're the enemy of uh, dementia. So you need to uh, consider whether any of those might be worsening their clinical state. All right, so let's talk about incontinence now. There are four types, and the most important is stress and urge. So stress tends to happen in uh, younger women, 
And it is basically when you get urine leakage, when you're laughing, coughing, or when intra-abdominal pressure increases. Urge incontinence is the most common uh, in everyone. Uh, so not just in younger women, but in older women, men as well. Um, and basically it's when someone gets an urge to urinate, they just experience sudden and uncontrollable um, bladder contraction. Overflow incontinence is, is to do with incomplete voiding and then the, the urine just builds up and up because they're not emptying their bladder until you get leakage. Um, and then functional incontinence is, is not an organic cause, but it's something like the patient being unable to get to the bathroom. We'll talk a bit more about the causes of each in the next few slides. Yes, yeah, so, uh, causes for stress incontinence are uh, generally pelvic floor disorder, um, surgery, childbirth, obesity, and some medications. Um, yeah, and then urge incontinence. There's two kind of categories of causes. I don't think this is that important, but either decreased inhibition of the nervous system. Um, so whether this be some kind of nervous neurological uh, disorder, such as demyelination, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, etc., or afferent stimulation, just making the bladder more sensitive. So maybe UTIs, urethritis, or a prolapse. Overflow is caused by either bladder outflow obstruction, so a benign prostatic hyperplasia, and maybe a bladder cancer, constipation, um, or some, for some reason why the, uh, the bladder can't contract, so autonomic neuropathy and diabetes, or some drugs. Functional uh, incontinence causes maybe poor mobility. Uh, loop diuretics cause people to urinate a lot, um, and that can be a, a cause. Being in hospital, they might be connected to lots of different machines. They might be unwilling to ask the nurses to get them to the loo. Uh, if you combine all of these things, then this is a problem. Um, and the reason this is a problem is because if they're, say, in hospital and they're incontinent, the moisture can cause pressure sores and infection. And it's not very nice for them either. So how do we investigate? We need to do a urine dip to check there's not a UTI. Um, we might do some bloods to check whether they're diabetic. A bladder scan, now, this is really simple. Uh, you might get the chance to do this in a &E, uh, or you might have already had the chance to do it. Um, but basically you can do a pre and post bladder void scan to see what the post void residual capacity is. Um, in urge incontinence this is normal, but in the others this tends to be uh, higher than usual. You can get them to do a toilet diary to see whether there's any particular causes of their incontinence, maybe whether it's caffeine intake, uh, or times of stress or you know in sort of functional it might be when they're on the bus in particular things like that urodynamic studies um PassMed has some really good questions on the investigations i think they're probably a bit detailed for the final but it might be worth just having a look at them um okay so management so this is key and the highlighted ones are generally the exam favorites so if you've got someone with stress incontinence it'll be a woman for two, three years post childbirth, um, they get leakage when they laugh or cough. Uh, the management is pelvic floor exercises. You can then consider drugs, alpha mimetic drugs, such as pseudoephrine or TCAs, but I don't think it'll ever go much past pelvic floor exercises. Urge incontinence, uh, the, the buzzword is bladder retraining. I'm not really entirely sure what that is, um, but that, that's what you need to Need to choose and then you can consider these drugs called oxybutynin or tolteridine they're anticholinergics and we mentioned those as a cause of delirium you need to be really careful in older patients because they're anticholinergic they can increase the risk of fall significantly so you need to be really careful when you know maybe in, a, in an oski before suggesting these drugs all right moving on now to fecal incontinence i really never was able to find much uh, to learn here. The important thing is to rule out core compression and it's the same in urinary incontinence as well. You need to be careful of corda equina. Remember that that is a uh, well, it's an emergency and they need urgent MRI imaging and uh, neurosurgical referral. Um, another cause is a pedendal palsy and people can get that after a traumatic childbirth. It might be worth remembering that the pedendal nerve is S2 to S4. Um, and also diabetes and demyelinating disorders. Right, let's talk about pharmacology. Uh, I haven't got very much on this. Um, first of all, 
pharmacokinetic, so this relates to the ADME, so the absorption, distribution, metabolism and excretion of drugs. So older people, uh, you need to consider their swallow when you're prescribing oral meds, uh, whether that's because they've had a stroke uh, or they're reaching the end of their life. The swallow can be compromised, so you have to be really careful. There's a little bit about body weight and fat to water ratio, but I don't really think that's too relevant. Um, what is important is the excretion. Older people, they tend to have dodgy kidneys, whether that's through diabetes or, or hypertension or anything like that. When we're calculating their EGFR, we use the Cockrell-Gault um, formula, and you can get this on MedCalc. Uh, it is useful. It takes into account their creatinine, uh, their age, and their weight. So it's also important in children. Um, so that's worth remembering. I think that was a past question at some point, either in... Um, Jerry's or renal. So polypharmacy, this is really the life of a geriatrician uh, is crossing off drugs in someone's drug chart. So it's defined as four or more drugs, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot. Um, when you're calculating how many drugs someone's on, you need to consider over-the-counter herbal remedies such as St. John's wort or anything like that. Um, now, Obviously, there are, there are reasons for prescribing lots of drugs in an older person. They might have complex medical needs. And there's two buzzwords here. Um, so you've got PIMS and PPOs. So PIMS are potentially inappropriate medications. So these are drugs that are prescribed that the patient doesn't necessarily need or might be too dangerous um, for them. Then you've got PPOs, which are potential prescribing emissions. And this might come under, uh, you know, come with problems such as patients doctors being unwilling to prescribe older people certain medications when they actually need them. The next two things I've included, I think they're in the lectures, I've never seen them come up, I've never seen them used in clinical practice, although they may well be. Um, Beer's criteria, so this places drugs into three groups for older people, drugs to avoid, drugs to avoid with certain comorbidities and drugs to use, and then the stop-start tool, um, and this kind of is a list of, of poor prescribing practice examples and good prescribing practice examples. You've heard of them, I don't think they'll come up. Falls, okay, why is it important? Hip fractures, if you do even get to fix it, there's still a one year 30% mortality. It's not just because of the fall of a hip fracture, but what that fall represents, worsening function. And so it is really important that we consider this Remember, falls can happen in the community, and they'll get admitted to A&E, brought up to the Jerry's ward, but also falls happen on the ward every night. When you're an F1, you know, on call, through the night, you'll probably get at least two or three fallers a night that you need to consider why they've fallen, whether you need to investigate it, whether they need CT hairs, or anything like that. This is an important topic. Risk factors, previous falls, uh, being female, living alone, and comorbidities. A lot of these come with diabetes, so foot problems, vision problems, orthostatic hypotension, uh, so that's a, a postural drop in, in blood pressure, so we assess that with a lying standing blood pressure. Things like arthritis, neurological disease as well. The most important two are antihypertensives causing orthostatic hypotension and the environment, so you know, factors within their home, you know, do they live on a in a two-story flat or you know do they have stacked up to their house or is their house a complete mess things like that need assessing by the OTs. Complications, pressure sores if they're lying down for a long time that can cause infections, acute kidney injury either due to dehydration or rhabdomyolysis these can be quite difficult to differentiate between but you need to consider the cre creatine kinase. If the CK is really high it's rhabdo generally above a thousand uh, if it's just a little bit raised, the AKR might be more due to uh, dehydration. It doesn't make a lot of difference, they need fluids either way. Um, pneumonias, hypothermia, fractures and fear. Of course, if someone's fallen once, they're more likely to fall again. They might not leave the house. Um, so it's important to address these things. Investigating them. We need to consider a CT head. I'm not going to go through the criteria now. Uh, it's in neuro. It is kind of important. Um, and it is clinically relevant when you're assessing people on the on the wards who have fallen. Examine their, their cardiovascular system. Do they have AF? Have they had a stroke? 
you know, same CNS exam, do a FRAX score for osteoporosis risk, and you may consider doing a cognitive test. Again, look at what they've come in for. They might just need extra work up for specific reasons um, and by specific specialists, depending uh, on what they've come in with. Management, treat the course, involve the multidisciplinary team. They need a meds review if they have a long standing blood pressure drop. Um, I remember in one of the OSCE comms practice stations, um, one of them was a, an elderly person who'd fallen and what they wanted was you to stop their ACE inhibitor. Um, and people are generally afraid to do that in an OSCE, but don't be because um, a week without an ACE inhibitor waiting for a GP follow up to, to, to do something else probably won't kill them. Uh, but if, you know, if their blood pressure is dropping 50 millimetres every time they stand up and they're going to fall, then, then they might die of that. So you need to be, you need to be quite uh, brave in stopping these mess. Pressure sores. So risk factors for pressure sores um, is obviously pressure, shear force, um, friction and moisture, whether that's due to a fever causing sweats or incontinence. The water low score, I'm pretty sure this has come up in, in, in uh, one of our exams, and this predicts the development of pressure sores and takes into account a lot of different risk factors. You can look it up if you want, I wouldn't learn it. Grading, again this is quite important, uh, this could come up in the spotter. Uh, so you've got non-blanching erythema is grade 1, so that's just like a red patch. Um, a bit of skin loss, just the epidermis or dermis, so effectively like a, a, a mild ulcer is um, grade two, grade three, you might see some fat. Um, that's full thickness skin loss. And grade four is when you can see the bone, the tendon, the muscle. Management, they need a pressure mattress. And what that does is it inflates in different parts throughout the day, so it shifts them, just the pressure. Uh, they need improvement in hygiene. They might need analgesia and antibiotics. If it's really bad, so grade three or four, they might need skin debridement with uh, flat formation. Okay, palliative care. So I said this is a small topic. Um, it is. It is really important. And I think it's worth remembering well because it comes up a lot in finals. It may come up in the OSCE and it comes up in the PSA next year as well. So written symptoms. I think this is really how to spot when someone might be nearing the end of their life. So they'll have a decreased food and fluid intake. Their swallow will worsen, they may look gaunt and pale, they may become more drowsy, alternatively they might become more agitated. And respiratory changes, there's something that has an awful name, it's called a death rattle, and that's effectively when secretions build up and the patient sounds as if they're, they're rattling. This is actually generally worse for the relatives than the patient, because if it gets to that stage the patient's cognition is, is likely to be pretty poor. So. Dealing with agitation, you need to consider why. Maybe they're in urinary retention and you need to do uh, put a catheter in. Maybe they need some more analgesia. Maybe they're just scared or maybe they've got nausea. I'd say in contrast to delirium, we need to be quick to um, relieve this. Um, it's distressing for the patient. It's distressing for the family and healthcare staff as well. The most common drug used is midazolam, which is a benzo and that can be given by a subcut uh, driver. Diazepam can be give, given PR, um, and, and haloperidol is another good one because that has antiemetic effects too. Pain, don't be afraid of opiates. Use morphine or dimorphine. Fentanyl is useful if they've got renal impairment, and you can use uh, fentanyl or buprenorph patches too. Uh, this is kind of... PSA, but also it, it can come up in, in the spotter. We had a lot of pharmacology in our fourth year spotter, and I'm pretty sure this came up. So if uh, you've got a patient, let's say they're on a, a daily dose of 50 milligrams of morphine uh, orally, and suddenly they're, they're reaching the end of their life, and that needs to be converted to a subcut dose, you divide it by two. The other good little bit of maths to remember is that a breakthrough dose should be about a sixth of the daily dose. Um, these are worth remembering. There's loads of PSA teaching on it. I suggest you, you do it before the fourth year finals. Other problems palliative patients get is secretions. So they get a death rattle, 
um, as I said. Uh, you need to set them up. Uh, you've probably they're probably overloaded, so don't maybe stop their fluids. You there are two drugs that are important to remember. You've got glycopyronium, which is a non-sedating anti-secretory, or hyacine hydrobromide, which is a sedating anti-secretory. Um, I don't think you'll particularly be asked to differentiate between them, but it's worth knowing what they are. Nausea and vomiting. Generally, uh, we use haloperidol or cyclosine. A few other considerations. I think this is probably good OSCE knowledge. Um, set up a syringe driver and do it early. Prescribe all of their anticipatory meds. Um, generally, you get like a palliative bundle. So when you put someone on end-of-life care, um, the palliative care team will come and prescribe all your glycopyronium, uh, like midazolam, things like that, in anticipation so that if someone does get sick, the nurses can just give the right meds without having to call a doctor every time. Stop unnecessary medications. If someone's nearing the end of their life, they probably don't need their antihypertensives or diabetic medication. Things like furosemide, it's not not necessary um, unless it's going to cause symptoms if you stop it. Uh, you might want to discontinue their OBS and their blood. Um, consider whether fluids and nutrition are really relevant here. You know, overloading a patient is probably worse than underloading them. If they're thirsty, you can um, use the little uh, sponges to moisten their, their mouth. Um, and it's important to remember as well, if you've decided to stop treating someone, IV fluids, NG and PEG feeding is classified as treatment. I've really briefly given some uh, points about a DNA CPR, uh, so this is a do not resuscitate order. It's a clinical decision. While the patient and family's input is really important, at the end of the day, if the doctor or medical team doesn't think it will work, they don't have to do it. But this obviously needs to be phrased delicately, and this is quite a Kolmanowski station. I think we had this uh, in our fourth year finals. You need to tell uh, the patient that you've made the do not resuscitate decision. The only exception is when there's a risk of actual harm. This isn't just risk of distress, but there's a risk that you feel like this, telling them this, might cause them to go outside and hurt themselves or hurt others. And you need to include the family in the decision and also let them know what's happened. Right, so the comprehensive geriatric assessment. This is basically a standardized way and a holistic way for geriatricians to assess older people, either when they come into hospital, um, when they might have to undergo surgery, when there's a transfer of their care, or, this is a bit strange, but when they have two or more of the geriatric giants, and you can read about these, um, I don't think it's particularly relevant clinically, um, but these are just things that, that older people tend to get. So, oh, excuse me. Um, so the parts of this, there's there's five main parts, and you need to consider the medical factors affecting this patient, their mental health, including their capacity to make decisions, their functional capacity, can they uh, feed themselves, dress themselves, uh, do they need a package of care, uh, their social circumstances, what support do they have, and their env environmental circumstances, where do they live, is it appropriate, can they travel, uh, things like that. Um, I've never seen a question on this. I think it's worth knowing what it is. Um, but I think it's, it'd be pretty hard to construct a question. There's a lot more detail into the parts of the CGA that you can look up. Um, but I haven't included it here because it's just a big list. All right, finally, elder abuse and safeguarding. I wasn't really sure uh, how much of this to include. Um, but I think the main things are capacity assessments. Can the patient understand, retain, weigh up and communicate uh, their decisions. This is really relevant in older people, especially if they are delirious. Um, consider when they might come out of their delirium, whether they will come out of their delirium. If a patient is deemed uh, not to have capacity, you must act in their best interests. Uh, I'm sure there's probably Epstein lectures that you can look at with a lot more detail on this, but this is really the um, exam, uh, exam favourite. Power of attorney, this is someone who is uh, legally designated to make decisions on, uh, for a patient based on their finances, their health or their well-being. It is only valid when capacity is lost um, and it can be overridden. So if, if the medical team 
or the police feel like uh, this power is being abused, um, then, then it can be legally overridden. Deprivation of liberty, or DOLS, uh, it's regulated by the Mental Capacity Act. It's basically a um, something that can be used to prevent people leaving where they're being looked after, whether this be their hospital or their care home. Um, and it's used when the patient doesn't have capacity. I don't know a lot of detail about it, um, but it might be worth reading a little bit more. Um, lots of patients are on it because obviously when a patient becomes um, delirious, they might try and leave the hospital a lot. It's a cardinal feature of hyperactive delirium, escapism. Um, so different measures can be it can be made to, to to control this. I think things like physical restraint are really last line. Um, so there is definitely a spectrum. So that's everything on geriatrics, uh, healthcare of the elderly. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Um, I think Jerry's certainly looking at. at what has come up in the past. It's an excuse for them to include some general medical questions. I'm not saying it's worth reviewing all the things like cardiology and respiratory, um, but just be aware that there are often general medical questions as well as the things that I've talked about today. So thanks very much for listening um, and all the best in your exams.